All right, welcome to the show today. Our guest today, we have a special individual. He's also here in Phoenix, Arizona, very close to our USA offices. So he's an entrepreneur, he's a strategist, he's a Wall Street Journal and USA Today best-selling author of a book called Exponential Theory. We're going to talk about that. Now, this gentleman has sold 12 companies. He's built three nonprofits and three accelerators. He's generated over $4 billion, that's with the B, in documented results. So he's not just a talker, he's actually a doer. He's also been entrepreneur in residence at Arizona State University, Thunderbird Singularity University at NASA, didn't know that existed, and taught at Stanford Design School. What has this man not done? That should be the question. So he was also the co-executive producer of the award-winning documentary, The University, which featured Stephen Hawking, Buzz Aldrin, Peter Diamondus, might be pronouncing that wrong, Ashton Kutchner, and Will I Am. And his mission is to help create a new generation of leadership. We're going to find out what that means one that is purposeful, conscious, digital, and above all, exponential. I like that. Uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Aaron Bear. Aaron, how are you? Good, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. So. I know. We've had to reschedule a few times. That is our fault on here. So <laughs> it's good to have you on here. And you're close. I didn't realize you were a neighbor. You're just, I mean, you're probably like 15 minutes south. That's oh, yeah, I'll, I'll pass your office here today, I'm sure. So I like it. All right. Now, normally on this show, we, we focus a lot on human behavior and, and how that applies to being a top seller, um, which we're going to talk a lot about that today. Uh, but we're also going to talk a lot about your, your business background, because uh, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners on here. And we've got a lot of sales professionals that, hey, they're maybe thinking about like, how do I start my own company? How do I start my own business? Okay. So let's um, maybe tell us a little bit. Let's just kind of dive into your story. And give our listeners maybe a feel of really how you arrived at this point in your life where you're one of the elite authorities on entrepreneurship and sales, really. Tell us yeah. a little bit about your background. How did how did it start for you? Like, how'd you learn all those skills? Well, I, you know, I think in my book, Exponential Theory, I kind of take this journey where I, I really launched into this accelerated learning period when I was about 20 years old. Okay. And uh, that was a time that I I learned that. You know, if you're going to learn, you got to put yourself in your, you know, out and out of your comfort zone. So, um, what I did is I, I ended up taking this uh, trip called Semester at Sea. For some of your listeners, probably know what it is, but I, I literally boarded a boat with 500 other students, uh, flew to the Bahamas. I had never been out of the country. I didn't even know anyone that had been out of the country. Okay. I grew up in Indiana, you know, very Midwestern. You know, didn't have a global view. Uh, sure. But I went to the Bahamas, went to Venezuela, Brazil, South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, India, Taiwan, Japan, China, and then back to the U.S. And every time I stepped into a new country, I kind of stepped more into an uncomfortable zone and, and started learning about myself. But when I came back, I just was so excited about learning. And the one thing I wanted knew I wanted to be, my dad, another little story that kind of led me to this, when my dad was... When I was 12 years old, my dad left his company and started a Subway sandwich shop. <laughs> okay, okay, right. So I grew up, uh, I was one of the original sandwich sandwich artists. Um, when, I was, when I was 12, I was child labor at 12 making sandwiches. Sure. Um, but that led me to my dad having a lot of freedom and, and why I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Okay. And my path was through sales is what I did learn yeah. is that sales is the lifeblood of a company. And that's where I was able to sell 12 companies is basically because my sales ability, uh, many of those, I actually sold products that didn't exist Yeah. Um, where I made a PowerPoint that looked like it was software and I'd click through it and act like the software existed. I'd sell it, then I'd have to go make it. So <laughs> okay, um, but, that, but that, that takes the new meaning of fake it till you make it to, uh, it was, to a whole new level there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was. <laughs> Um, and I actually sold a two hundred fifty thousand dollars software project, you know, to to kind of uh, launch a launch a company without actually only having a PowerPoint. That um, you know, so PowerPoint skills are are important yeah. uh, after all. But um, I, I agree. Let's talk about your book, the Ex Exponential Theory. Why did you write the book, and who did you write it for? Walk yeah. Us so over the last fifteen years, um, you know what what I 
basically have been doing is been an innovation facilitator for global 100 companies. So companies like Daimler, uh, which is Mercedes Benz, uh, Coca Cola, and Belfius Bank, which is the National Bank of Belgium. And those three organizations in particular, I would take and I help, I take them into different markets around the world. So like Shanghai, Singapore, Tel Aviv, London, Copenhagen, New York, Silicon Valley. And we take their executives out of their comfort zone. And then we would introduce them to all these exponential companies. And the goal was, you're a big behemoth. You think you're doing all right. Yeah. But the, candidly, every part of your business is being disrupted by some small technology company that okay. literally is saying, I'm going to beat, I'm just going to beat you here. Yeah. And for the first time, those companies were like, well, we're number one in all, we get all the best employees. We're number one in all these areas. They started to learn that, uh, it's linear thinking versus exponential is that exponential thinking will overcome. There's a long period of deception, uh, which, you know, Tesla is probably the, one of the greatest examples of that, where for a long, long time, the automobile manufacturers just dismissed that electric cars and dismissed this. Elon Musk had this long-term vision, obviously now has disrupted the automobile industry and, and potentially will disrupt other industries with that as Tesla. And that's kind of built into Tesla stock price, but sure. You know, to me, um, the book is really built for innovators, entrepreneurs uh, to start thinking bigger about their their lives, even sales professionals. You know, the, yeah. the reality is, um, you know, I have a coaching program that's outside of the book called Exponential Mindset, Belief and Attitude. I call it the XMBA. Okay. For 10 years, I taught in MBA programs, uh, Thunderbird and, and uh, ASU. And yeah. in that, you know, the MBA is a great degree for middle management. Mm. <laughs> It really trains you to be an employee. Uh-huh. Uh, it trains you to, you know, manage a, manage a function, and it can be helpful. But the reality is, there's nothing greater than experience itself. Is just getting out there and making the mistakes, learning from them. Yeah, winning and learning is what I say. Is like the only time you really fail is if you don't learn something. So just 100%. keep putting yourself in an uncomfortable position. Hundred percent. Now I want to weave this in and out, uh, business and sales, because they're really. I mean, they're. They're really both obviously interconnected. You can't scale a company without sales. You can't have any success without sales. But you talk, uh, you you talked a little bit there, and I want to roll back in. You said you talked about how linear companies will eventually die, and I believe in your book you talk about how to embrace like a. And correct me if I'm wrong. The new circular economy by implementing the is it the Rotom rule. Rhodium. So what is, walk um, us through what that means. Walk, walk us through for us, you know, beginners over here, what that actually means. So I'm sure you've heard of the golden rule is uh, treat yes. others treat others as uh, as they want to be, as, as you want to be treated. And then there's the platinum rule, which is treat others as they want to be treated, which I think is, is today and today's generation is, has a little bit more empathy built in it than the golden rule. Okay. And then, on top of that, rhodium is the most expensive metal there is, and mm. it's made from from platinum. Okay. So it has the platinum rule built in it. Um, so the the kind of uh, creativity that I got there is that we need a new rule is to think about the entire ecosystem. Okay. As a CEO of a small business or a large business, you yeah. have to start thinking about all the different stakeholders and how they fit into your decision, not just, you know, the shareholders. Um, yeah. So the stakeholders, meaning uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, the environment, all these other aspects. And what, what, I, what I realized from spending 15 years with exponential leaders that were growing exponential companies, people yeah. like Elon Musk, yeah. is that they became very conscious as they grew there because they were very connected to the customer and they're very much listening to the customer, just like all of our sales professionals on the call are. Yeah. All of our entrepreneurs need to be, you know, all of our CEOs need to really be focused on that. So as exponential companies grow, it's thinking about the entire ecosystem that's going to help them grow that much faster. When they don't think about one of those, it actually slows their growth because now they're being persecuted for it. Uh, mm. Customers going out of favor. So for yeah. the first time with social media, you know, and nowhere to hide, you know, doing the right thing becomes the right business policy. Even if it costs you more, it mm-hmm. actually will give you bigger results in the end. And that's what the book kind of lays out as a theory. It proves that these companies have, that have gone exponential have really gotten there because they've thought more consciously. Now, has that, is, is it in your mind, is that 
Is that what you feel like uh, Elon Musk is doing now with, you know, getting involved with Twitter and, and social media? Like, you know, you've got the CEO of, you know, SpaceX, which just, you know, crushed NASA. You know, nobody could do it. The government was just, it was the only government could succeed. And he obviously came in in a very short time and showed that that's not the case. Uh, the cars, right? Everybody's, nobody really thought about electric cars. Now it's like going to be the norm, I would say, in the next five to 10 years. I think even like, you know, Land Rover and BMW and all these cars, I mean, that's where they're going to have to go to compete. So in your mind, what's what's his play with Twitter? Is he looking at that like, hey, this is not just about money. This is not about this and this. This is about this. In your mind, what what's the play there for Elon? Well, I, you know, I've studied Elon a lot and I think you know, candidly, he's probably the person that's created more shareholder value for his own companies. Yeah. Um, it's a lot harder for when he goes outside of his own companies. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's played with Dogecoin, Bitcoin, okay. uh, now Twitter, and he's really a disruptive force. Yeah, He may have, in, in what I call in the book, is a massive transformative purpose okay. um, around what Twitter could be. Um, yeah. But, you know, some of his thoughts, he hasn't probably spent the time Obviously, this comes, you know, very quickly that he realizes he's potential to be able to take it over and, and have these kind of thoughts. Yeah. Um, you well, know, it's, a it's a public forum. It's like the de facto, even though it's not as big as some of the social media uh, platforms, it's really the public town forum, right, throughout the world. No matter if you live in Iraq or Iran or if you're living in Iowa, if you live in Japan, it's kind of like the public forum that everybody's using. So, yeah, I, I'm just interested to know your thoughts. I don't know much about Elon. I just look at him as like an entrepreneur that basically does things that people don't believe can be done. Right. And that's really what it's all about. So. All right. So let's talk about let's let's dive into sales. So you said, you know, hey, I, I was selling, you know, software and stuff before I even made it. I had these powerful presentations, which obviously that was the case. Why do you feel that it's so important uh, for a business owner, let's say, because a lot of times business owners are like, oh, I'm not in sales. We have a sales team, but I'm not in sales. Why do you feel like it's so important for entrepreneurs and business owners to really learn the right skill sets to be able to sell and communicate in today's, let's say, ultra competitive world that we live in? Well, you know, my history is I used to run the National Association of Sales Professionals, so I took a lot of different sales training. The reality is every job we're in sales, like accountants, you know, when they present numbers are selling, you know, they're selling those numbers with the confidence they have in those or that their job to do it. Yeah. I think it goes to a CEO or a, a business owner. Yeah. Um, if they have a partner that is more sales oriented, they may be able to get away with it. Yeah. But the reality is, uh, you know, the engineer can grow a company to a certain point without the sales skills, it'll really tap out. You won't go exponential. Well, it's, um, it's true. Like, I mean, look, Elon Musk, for example, Jeffrey Bezos. Like if you're, if you're a business owner and you're trying to get your employees to follow your vision of where you're taking the company, what are you doing? You're, you're trying to persuade, you're trying to convince, you're trying to influence, you're moving others, right? So you're an employee trying to convince your boss to give you a pay raise on the flip side. What are you doing? You're trying to persuade, influence, you're trying to move others. It's really, like you said, accountants are in sales. Attorneys trying to convince and judge your client's innocent is trying to move, persuade. If you're in politics, you're trying to move, persuade, influence others to vote for you. Really, everyone's in sales at this point. I agree with you 100%. You were saying something, I cut you off. Well, it just, it's, you know, I think you're, you're emphasizing the point that I was going to make is, it, you know, it really is about embracing sales, you know, sales has, you know, been a bad word for, you know, a long time. And when I run the National Association of Sales Professionals, mm -hmm. I wanted to write an article that sales was dead. And I, and I hope that makes people. And the reason I was going to say that is because you never get caught selling. The, the fact is the internet has created a gigantic buyer funnel that mm -hmm. people are now just wanting to spend their time buying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we go as consumers and as materialist of what is the next thing we're going to buy. And that's where compare culture and cancel culture and all these things where you're doom scrolling, you know, through this are only really rewiring your dopamine to buy more. Yeah. What part of that is creating a buyer funnel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where marketing and sales has merged, where true sales professionals understand marketing can leverage some of those aspects and levers to kind of create success. But yeah. bringing them through a buyer funnel, and I used Robert Cialdini's Powers of Influence 
yeah. um, as kind of part of it is every sales process, no matter what is out there trained, there's, you know, there's Sandler that sells the pain, there's Carnegie that sells the happiness, there's, you know, but it, it starts off with you have to connect with people, you ask them questions and you close. Um, that process very much fits into Cialdini's powers of influence is when you connect with people, you're connecting with them for authority or liking. Uh, when you're asking questions, you're doing it to create consistency, social proof. And then you jump to closing when you create reciprocity, contrast, and scarcity. Yeah, and, when you create urgency and pain and scarcity. I agree with 100%. Yeah. And it's really, you know, jumping back in there, it's really about, um, you know, going back. And, and it's interesting because, like, so my background is behavioral science and human psychology. That's what I went to college for. So I'm like the boring science guy, probably, probably like you are. I, I know one yeah. thing and that's about it. If you asked me to go change the light bulbs in here, I probably would have to go to YouTube. I wouldn't really have much of an idea, but there's really three forms of communication, right? Behavioral science. It's really like if you, and I'll, there's, there's different terms for them, but like the first one would be like, I'll give you, I'll give everybody like a, um, I'll say, I'll say something. And I want you to imagine what's the first word or thought that, or first image that comes in your mind. So the first mode of selling or communication would be more like boy, the room selling. Like, what's the image that everybody has when I say boiler room selling? You probably think of like, oh, the Wolf on Wall Street show, right? That's what people would automatically think. So we're the least persuasive when we try to um, manipulate, when we try to, when we tell people things, when we, when we try to uh, push them to do something we want them to do. That's kind of like the first mode of selling or communication. Second mode is more like discussion and debate. I would say the term most salespeople can identify with if you're in professional sales would be more like consultative selling, right? Like the standard logical questions came out in the 80s with a, a book, Neil Rackham, Spin Selling. You would know about Spin this, selling, obviously, yeah. right? Yeah, it was groundbreaking at the time, you know, but you know, you're asking logical based questions uh, to find the needs of the client. But the challenge with that, when you're asking logical based questions, what type of answers do your prospects give in return? logical based answers. And as you know, do human beings make decisions on emotion or logic, right? Brain studies show that it's emotion. Third mode of communication, uh, behavioral science shows is the most persuasive. It would be more like dialogue, right? When we're, like you said, we're asking the right questions that build in our prospect's mind that shows our expertise and what we're communicating by the questions, the skilled questions we're actually asking that gets them to think deeper about their challenges, problems, and issues that maybe they've never thought really that deep about before. So it's kind of interesting when you really think about it. Cause I, you know, we get a lot of people like, oh, you know, the greatest sales book that's ever been written is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I think it's a great book. The challenge with that is it was written in 1936. And prospects in 1936 are buying behaviors are significantly different in many ways now because of, like you said, the power of technology with the internet and especially social media. Back in the day, you know, people expected to be educated by the salesperson because that's how they learned about what you what your company did. You know, besides like maybe radio or you know newspapers or you know later years TV. That's the bridge between the the company and the consumer was the salesperson educating the public. Okay, but like you said, with the power of the internet and especially social media. You know, your prospects know everything about you. They know, you know, how long you've been in business. They know your price points. They know who your competitors are. They know your reviews, what type of results you do or don't get. They know everything about you by, like you said, doing a, a Google search on their freaking phone. Yep. And because of that power, they'll no longer be manipulated by pushy, high pressure salespeople because they know they have many choices to choose the exact product or service that you sell. Did you find that like when you were running these businesses and selling, is that what you kind of saw out there when you're running that organization? Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, I, I also think that there, you know, to, to your point about emotions, I think we, we are run by emotions. We back up on facts, like to, to your point. Yeah. And I think part of the, the internet, you know, if you connect with someone and you trust them, you'll pay a higher price just because you trust them and have a relationship. So, yeah. so much is getting away from transactions and, and yeah. salespeople building relationships, obviously yeah. helping people solve their problem. And that's kind of part of my own buyer funnel when I, I coach CEOs and salespeople yeah. Yeah. is really around helping them understand is, you know, always do the right thing. You know, it's the same with what I'm talking in exponential theory is, yeah. you know, it helped them get where they need to go. Yeah. And if it's not actually through your product, 
Yeah. They will then actually go refer 10 people. Yeah. Every time they hear that problem, you'll get referrals on belief and you'll grow your business exponentially. So it's yeah, because they trust, they, the thing, trust, but, they trust you, right? Yeah. And I think so many salespeople, and it's not their fault, it's just the way a lot of you know old school diehard sales trainers learned it and they repackaged it a different way. And a lot of companies, most companies still use it. Even Fortune 100 companies, we've been in audits and then we're like, whoa, I can't believe they're still using it. I mean, that's like really old school. Like you guys are doing well, but you're spending so much money on leads because you're just turn and burn when you don't have to, right? You just need more skilled conversations than quantity of conversations and your marketing budgets go drastically down and you're going to sell way more. But I, I think there's this old adage, you know, even from that book, you know, people buy from people who they like. Well, in 1936, yes, uh, but people really buy now from people who they feel can get them the best result. Now, if they like you, that's just a bonus. But if you're comparing apples to apples and you've got somebody you like, you really like grandma, Okay, she's got this product. You love grandma. You love your aunt. They've got this great product, but they've got a competitor, and you feel that competitor is going to give you a better result than grandma. Who are you going to buy from? The person who gives you the best result. Because if that's not the case, then why would people buy from like Amazon? You know, they just go down to their local retail mom and pa shop and buy something, but they buy from Amazon because Amazon gets them a better result. They might like, like their neighbor that has the local store, but they're buying from Amazon because Amazon gives them a better result. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think when you're connecting with people, there's, you know, as I said, Cialdini has two things, is authority and liking, you know, and, and candidly, they don't have to like you if you're the authority. And that's, that's where you see a lot of pain selling, Sandler, different kinds of sales training that, that drive into that because you can establish authority very quickly. It also, though, I think in the long run becomes like, how do you reestablish the relationship where you're building trust and credibility and interest? Yeah. So I, I totally agree. I think it's, you know, today it is about ROI and it's about proving that case because with information, with data, you know, the reality is, is we're oftentimes and companies have learned is let's not one person make the decision. Let's actually have a few people sign off on this. So the internal champion selling, and this is B2B more than B2C. Sure. Yeah. And I think they, they are slightly different when you approach B2B versus B2C. And I, 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 I treat them. Well, it's how they buy, right? It's yeah. like, like you said, they, I mean, the average company, I was reading in Forbes the other day, the average company has 6.7 decision makers and or influencers that are going to, to influence the decision maker. You might have the head of IT, right? Let's say you're selling some type of software. They don't have any decision-making authority to say yes or no, but can they influence those who do because they're the ones implementing it? And oh, by the way, they might be scared that this new software is going to cost them their job or help other people in the company see that they have problems, which they could you know, get in trouble for. Like, There's so many influences that I think salespeople don't understand that, that these people who, you know, they can't say yes or no, but they can definitely influence the people in one way or the other, who you're talking to, for sure. Yeah, and I think that's that's a point that I, when I'm coaching, I often say is a lot of times salespeople approach and say, this is for your organization. Yeah. I reverse engineer that, and that's kind of part of my own buyer funnel is to get to the organization, it comes back to a professional, but before a professional comes back to them personally, and you you kind of hit this, you're, you're really saying the same thing, yeah. is that this IT professional, like, personally may be exposed if these decisions. So understanding having a personal, what will this software do for you? And then understanding those hurdles and helping them actually craft their message and kind of collaborating to create that message yeah. is an important part of it. But I, I use PPO, personal professional organization, approach it personally first, then yeah. professionally, then organizationally. And yeah. so many salespeople are trained just to say, hey, here's the ROI for your company. At the end of the day, that's not what the people make the decision in there. And they make it because of their own personal beliefs and how they'll actually, like, if they have to learn something, maybe they're at a place they don't want to learn that. Yeah, it's not cookie cutter. Like the CEO is concerned about the revenue numbers, but, you know, the the, the chief technology officer, they might be concerned about losing their job. You know, like you got, you've for different influencers and decision makers there's different personal reasons why they're going to buy or not buy. And you have to understand how to navigate through that organization. That's really a, one of the biggest differences with business to business sales between business to consumer is just navigating. How do you navigate through an organization and get everybody on board? That's a skill set in itself outside of just you know asking the right questions at the right time and listening to your prospect. It's how do you navigate? So instead of saying, hey, you know, you're talking to a C-level executive on a discovery call, like, hey, 
or, you know, who's beside you, who's the decision maker, instead of saying something like that, because a lot of C-level executives would be like, oh, no, I can make the decision, right? And then you're screwed because, you know, that's not the case, but they're holding back because they're like trying to find out if they even want to do something before they go anybody else. But if I just reword that question and I say, um, Amy, can you walk me through your company's decision making process when it comes to solving challenges like this? When I say walk me through your company's decision making process, her mind starts to walk me through, walk her through and me through. Oh, well, we need to talk with John over in, you know, in IT and we, we need to talk to our HR. And now you're starting to get more of a picture of who you really need to bring into this deal to make sure you have control of it. Because if you just think this first person you're talking to has control and you're hoping and praying that they're going to go to the right people and say the right things, that deal is probably 98%, 99% not going to happen. So you want to have control of that conversation and who you need to get involved in for sure. Yeah, it's, it's uh, and, and that's where I, I think the middle section of the buyer funnel of asking the questions is, is, is actually working on getting good crafted questions. Like you said, there are, there's double negative questions. There are some ways and it's non manipulative but you can get to the truth because yeah. the reality is it's uh, in leadership, we call it the five whys is, People are generally going to tell you on the surface level what they want. But if you ask why a few times, you'll get to the real answer. And that's you can do that with trust. You know, and I think that's also like when you approach it from the personal part of it. Now they're like, OK, they're aligned to help me get a you know, if this goes well, I'm going to get a promotion. And they know that. And I keep anchoring that back in to say, hey, you know, I'm going to help you. You know, let's craft this. So you introduce me to the right people. All of a sudden, they're yeah. going to let me go to work instead of holding holding the deal hostage where they're not as good as a sales professional than me. So I can't trust that they're going to go in the building and sell it better than I would, um, especially a product that's not theirs. So I have to figure out how do I get to those people that you're talking about? And I think the best way is to personally and professionally align with them. The organization will take care of itself. If everyone you do that with, and that's like you said, the nuances of knowing that the CEO personally, you know, has to hit a certain number at the end of the quarter. So there's a timing issue. The IT is like, I can only implement this, you know, because I'm going on vacation with whatever. I mean, all these little so nuances you things. start to learn. Yeah. But once you once you get those and you can have those conversations, you are in a buyer funnel. And the interesting thing about that is um, it, it kind of you made this point earlier about um, burning leads. Um, I close 50 percent plus of any deal that I'm in front of person. Yeah. And most of the ones I don't is I'm literally going for the no. I'm literally saying, no, I don't think this is the right fit for you. And they're then, you know, they really want it, but it really isn't the right fit. And those other people, they're then introducing me to people that are the right fit. So when I get in front of someone, my close ratio goes way, way up because I'm just being genuine, authentic, and I have trust. I have a warm lead. Well, my they view, referral network they, just grows. Yeah, they view you because of that. I mean, the, your trust is only created, like I said, by the, 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 your questioning ability and your listening, but that's how trust is generating with a prospect, not by you just telling them everything that there is to know, because that's what every salesperson does. It goes in one ear out the other, but by your questioning allows them to see the value you have and your expertise where they look at you as what we would call the trusted authority in this specific market. So they trust you automatically, right? And it's almost like, even when you say like, you know, based on what you've told me, I'm not sure we can help you. It's like, they're like, well, okay, but how could you help us? Like in another way, it's like, they're just like, you're, you're, you're pushing them back. And because of that, they're like pulling you in like, well, okay, but could you help us with something like this? Could you, could you, and they're trying to find ways to justify you helping them because you said you couldn't help them. And, and I think, I think part of that is, and you, you hit a key one is listening. And I always use, you have one mouth and two ears, but you actually listen a lot with your eyes too. So you know, if you're only you're only speaking 20 percent of the time, you'll yeah. get people there a lot faster because they're going to tell you how they want to be sold to. They're going to they're literally in a buyer funnel to say this is how this works. And if you just keep asking the right questions, um, yeah. that's where we're really even, you know, made to like listen to these conversations, yeah. find and craft if it is the right choice. But then just build a relationship that someday or another. And I'll tell you, my some of my biggest deals is when people move companies and they may, I say no to them there because it's not the right fit in that company. Yeah. Well, guess what? You know, in almost every industry, people leave their jobs every couple of years and generally they're moving up the ladder. So now here I am further in my career, a little bit older. All those people are now the decision makers. I have the trust. 
now things become really easy for me. And that's kind of part of that exponential where I can close 50 plus percent of the deals that I stand in front of because I'm authentically just saying, this is the right fit. This is the ROI that we're going to focus on. You know, this is how we're going to do it. This is going to help you personally, professionally. And then, you know, candidly, you're not selling, you're in a buying process that really just helps them make the decisions they need to make to actually be able to sell it to other people, but to sell it to themselves. Well, what you're describing is what top sales professionals and companies understand that selling, great selling is not adversarial. That, that's what most salespeople have been taught. Like they, they are still taught by sisters. I'm, I'm not kidding you that selling is somehow adversarial. It's you against the prospect, trying to manipulate them, trying to push them, trying to win them over so you can make money. I mean, that's what average salespeople do in our day and age. Like if you want to be average or like out of a job quick, do that because that's how prospects are going to view you. You want to be great at sales. You're going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in commissions or even seven figures a year as a W-2 salesperson, or even if you're an entrepreneur wanting to scale or a sales manager that wants to triple you know, your, your you know, sales in your division, you have to start viewing, like you said, that selling is collaborative, right? It's you working with the prospect, helping them find and solve problems that maybe they didn't really understand they had. Or maybe they knew they had a problem, but they didn't know how bad the problem really was, right? Or they didn't understand the consequences of what would happen if they didn't do anything about the solving the problem. And that's where massive trust, massive credibility is built. Well, they'll keep coming back and purchasing from you, even though you're more money, because they trust that you're going to get them the best result over any of these pushy salespeople that are trying to stuff their solution down their throat. It's a, it's a night and day difference in the income you make for sure. And it's also just in, in as a profession, you know, and that's where I, I ran this as a sales profession, which I think a lot of people don't think of as a profession. It's actually the biggest profession and the highest paying profession. So, you know, if people really wrap their heads around that, then they understand. Then it can really is the gateway to being an entrepreneur. All you then have to do is add a product or a service or, in, you know, invent something or be part of something. And yeah. all of a sudden you're off to being an exponential leader. And you can do that in sales. Like things just get easier when you think bigger. And I think that's part of, it's not necessarily always going for the home run, but yeah. I think when you build these trusts and credibility, a lot of times salespeople, and I literally got off a call today where someone was just literally wanting to sell me something. Yeah. And they were just not going to stop selling me some, but they didn't hear me literally, you know, part of the conversation could have been like that. They listened to me, yeah. they'd understand my concern. And then they would have kind of took me into a different, different way. Yeah. And then I would have then probably introduced them to the right people they wanted to meet, which yeah. would then they would have got a sale from someone that would have been the right fit for it. But they were just adamant about selling me and they weren't going to get off the phone. I just said, Hey, this is going to work out. And so we parted away. So they, I'm sure they got off the phone and they're all down. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. It again, and you know, but well, the, we the have reality to is, it's... sales professionals that that's that's you lose the sale not because of the prospect, but because of your communication skills. I think when salespeople, you know, you you know what I mean. You hear yeah, salespeople yeah. like, "Oh, the leads suck. Oh, my prospects have fear. They're just all fear based." Well, no shit, Sherlock. It's your job as a sales professional to help them overcome that fear. That's why you get paid so much. You have to learn the skills to help them overcome that, help them resolve their own internal conflicts or own objections and be able to move forward, solve their problems and get where they want to go. That's, that's your job as a sales professional. And once you take ownership of that and you're like, okay, I've got to learn more advanced skills, you're going to make a lot of money compared to all the ones that just sit around blaming the prospect. Yeah. I and mean, you're just a few conversations. I did this one time where um, uh, you'll, you'll find this interesting. I was on a stage and I was with a, a group of sales people in the audience. It was a, a many, many kind of convention. There's probably 150 people. And I said, okay, you're only a few calls away from anyone. And this is kind of the, the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross leads. I'm like, you know, right, lead, yeah, if you think leads are the problem. They're not the problem. The problem is, is that you're just not calling the right people. And I said, who could we get to that, basically would call us back. That seems impossible. And at the time it was Bill Gates. Okay. And within an hour and a half, we had Bill Gates on the phone. Oh, really? We used all 150 people in there. And we said, who can we all call to literally triangulate? And we found his assistant. We told him what we were doing. We were doing a behavioral science, you know, experiment that, you know, how do you connect with people to give these people the confidence? And so in an hour and a half, we're able to kind of reach the impossible 
Yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't plan on doing that on a stage anytime soon again, because I was really stressful during it, but <laughs> it, it proved the yeah, point that good. you're a, you're a few conversations from anywhere you want to be. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important part of life that, that people understand is that we all have equal, equal time and equal, you know, energy and equal all that. We then obviously our limitations in our own mindset, obviously bring us back to not reach the goals that we want. And that leads back to kind of my book, Exponential Theory is how do I actually help people become exponential? It's, it's creating that mindset, belief and attitude where they start thinking bigger. And a lot of that is, you know, getting, you know, putting the, the limitations, the regrets, you know, the traumas that are in our past, you know, all the rejection maybe from is understanding those were all obstacles to teach you something. If you did not learn something from those, Sure. then you're stuck in that past and yeah. until you learn something. But then once you do, then the future doesn't have the stress, worries, anxieties, fears, and doubts yeah. that we make up because of we're not living in the past, living that over and over again. We're, we're literally like saying, okay, I'm going to expand my mindset today. I'm going to grow it just a little bit. And that's where uh, I met a Navy SEAL. It said, improve 1% a day. And guess what that does in a year? That's 37x growth. So that's exponential. And that's where a sales professional like, hey, I made, you know, and, and whatever metric that you're you're driving at, your key performance metric, whether it's, yeah. you know, a lot of times it's calls, you know, people are 60 calls. Yeah. Well, you know, it doesn't hurt if you really want to be the best, then make 63 today or tomorrow and 66 yeah. the next day and yeah. just see what happens because it, it yeah. you know, what ending is it's, it's a game. And if you play it as a game, you can win that game. If you don't play it as a game, then it becomes, you know, a grind. And, and really focus, you know, like, you know, I, I sold in four different industries in my 17 year sales career before I started seventh level. And when I, before I picked up the phone, I had to sit back and think, okay, I'm calling these companies. They have this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem. They might not know they have the problem, but we all know they have the problem. <laughs> How can I best communicate to them uh, to get them to open up, uh, to have a real conversation about these problems? And so when you start thinking of yourself, like I talked about, more of a problem finder and problem solver, because all these books will say you have to be great at problem solving, but if they don't buy from you, you can't really solve problems. So you have to be better at problem finding in our day, helping them find problems they didn't think they had. So when you go in with the mentality of that, rather than the mentality of, I just got to make a hundred calls and you're just going through the motions like a freaking telemarketing robot and you have real conversations when you get on with them. I'm telling you guys, every list, everybody listening, your results will go through the roof compared to, I just got to call hundred leads today. You know, then I'm done. Just went through the numbers. Didn't make any appointments or sales, but hey, I called the hundred people. I'd rather focus on the quality of the conversation than the quantity of the calls, because that 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 you know, once you learn the right skill level, that that can make you, uh, your company, and most importantly, your prospects get where they want to go. I mean, really, if they don't buy, they can't really have what they want. Well, I think, and the interesting part about you know any profession and any learning is Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers said you have ten thousand hours. Yeah. Um, there's a guy named Michael Simmons, who is a mental model master, and he said 10,000 experiments. And that's where the, the numbers that you have, you know, and you get comfortable asking the questions and practice them. And that's where you and I both being in this industry, you know, if we had this both conversation 17, 20 years ago, yeah. we'd be very different conversation of sure. what we believe, what worked and didn't work. Yeah. Well, time and time and energy and everything has gone by. But yeah. I think when you really connect to people's purpose, per personally, professionally, organizationally, and that's really where I talk to CEOs, even when they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars or, yeah. you know, going public or anything, it's really to understand that everybody has a different motive. And whether we like it or not, there is, you know, we'll go to economics lesson here. There's self-interest, there's supply and demand, all these factors go into this. Yeah. If you can figure out what are those influences that help them make that decision, it becomes much, much easier. And it is just about the quality of conversations you have. Yeah. And that's where I don't have to have many conversations to close. Yeah. Hey, They're work less. Asking the right questions. Work less, talk to less people, but have higher value conversations and you're going to sell way more than you are. And you're not going to beat your head against the wall, hoping and praying that you're going to get a deal here and there. You have full control of that process because you know what you're doing, right? Hey, can't thank you enough to be on here. That was awesome. I really love it. We got to get together sometime here since you're so close. Yeah, let's uh, do it. Where can our listeners get your book? 
Uh, and then where can they learn more about what you do? Like they need to learn more about what you do. We don't, you know, obviously in 35, 40 minutes, you can basically tell us about 10% of 10% of 1% on a podcast. So where do they go to actually learn? Yeah. So you can find my book, Exponential Theory, The Power of Thinking Big on uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, you can visit me at aaronbear.com, A-A-R-O-N-B-A-R-E.com or on Instagram, Aaron Bear. Um, I, I obviously spend a lot of, a lot of time there connecting with people and sharing my message. So, um, beyond that, I always say for people to reach out, I always will spend the time to, to meet with people and, uh, learn and literally what we just talked about, I'll reverse engineer this and show how this works, but also, um, share if there is a solution that I can help them with or not. Love it. Aaron, thanks for being on. Take care. And we'll see you soon. Thanks everybody for being on. Thanks, Jeremy. Hey guys, if you enjoyed these, here's another you can watch right over here, right over here. Join our free sales revolution group. Click the link below, join us, and we're gonna help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.